So good to be here. Thank you, Pastor Garen, Pastor Shelley, and just the team here at Northwest. Um, real blessing to be here. Uh, like Pastor Garen said, I'm from Pennsylvania. Uh, I actually grew up in the Pittsburgh area, and I've been living in the Lancaster, Pennsylvania area the last uh, eight years now, over eight years. It is pronounced Lancaster, by the way. You probably know it as Lancaster, if you've heard of it. Um, but it is pronounced Lancaster. That's the official way. I had to learn that myself since I'm not from there. Um, but, yeah, so we, uh, we flew in. Uh, this is Marvin. Marvin, would you just kind of wave your hand up front here? Marvin Byler. Yeah, Marvin's, uh, yeah, thanks. Give a round of applause for Marvin. Marvin is uh, an intern at Threshold Church. That's a church where I serve as pastor. And, uh, yeah, he's one of our interns. And he's traveling here with me to help you on the ministry team. And so I'm just looking forward to what God wants to do this weekend. I believe this is a divine appointment. I have no doubt that God has ordained this time together. And God is really highlighting the ministry of deliverance in this hour. I really believe that in the body of Christ, in this nation. He's really wanting to emphasize and bring it back uh, to, to the forefront. Not that it's everything, but just to give it the place that we see in Scripture, the focus that Jesus had on it. And so we're going to be covering uh, several different topics over these next couple of days. I hope you're able to come to all the meetings as much as possible because we're going to kind of progress through some things and we'll have ministry times as well. Uh, so let's just pray. Let's open up in some prayer here. I want to pray and just ask the Holy Spirit to maximize this time and really uh, just, yeah, minister even as, uh, even as we go forward. Father, I thank you for this night. God, I thank you for your heart to see people restored, delivered, set free, Father. And I thank you for the price that was paid. I thank you for the precious blood of Jesus that was shed for us, God, that we could be forgiven, so that we could be redeemed, so that we could be delivered from the kingdom of darkness. And so, Father, right now I declare that the kingdom of heaven is at hand in this place. Lord, I declare, Lord, that the heavens are opened up in this room, Father. I thank you that the heavens are opened up, Father. Father. Lord, I thank you for your angels. I ask for your holy angels, God, even to be released to minister. And God, I pray for your Holy Spirit to move, God. Let your Holy Spirit, Lord, bring revelation. God, I pray you'd move through the, through the preaching, through the teaching of your word, God. You'd move through the ministry, God. Lord, I thank you that the entrance of your word brings light and so I pray, God, even through this time in the Word, Lord, that you'd, that you'd release light, God. Let there be light, Father. God, I thank you for your anointing that breaks the yoke, God, that sets captives free, that breaks chains of bondage and affliction and torment and oppression, Father. And we invite you, Holy Spirit, to do that. Lord Jesus, would you walk among us? Would you walk among us? Would you move in this place, Father? Thank you, Father. God, we just give you this time. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen. Well, if you have a Bible, you can open up to the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark. We're going to be there in a little bit here. I just Before we get into that, I um, just want to kind of share a bit about my background, about my journey, and even how God led me into this whole topic of, of deliverance, right? Uh, the whole topic of casting out demons and freeing people from the influence of evil spirits. I know this can be a topic that gets a wide range of responses. This is a topic that uh, has oftentimes been ignored in the church. It's often been ignored or neglected in the, especially the Western church, where maybe we don't always have a, a supernatural worldview, and so we can kind of maybe diminish it, or maybe we think it's just superstition or just kind of ancient tradition, or, or maybe we just don't know how it's relevant to our lives today. We can read the stories in the Gospels. I completely understand that. I completely get that. I did not grow up in a church background that believed in really anything supernatural. I grew up in a, in a, uh, a great, great Christian family. My parents were saved when I was about two years old, and we ended up going to a church that uh, just didn't believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit or in the speaking in tongues or the supernatural or healing, deliverance. So I didn't grow up exposed to anything like that. Deliverance would be the last thing that would ever happen in the church that I grew up in. And so if this topic is a little bit new to you or you're kind of like, oh, I'm, not, you know, I'm not sure what this is about, well, first of all, thanks for being here anyways. That's awesome. And second of all, I completely get it. I completely get it. And so I just want to share a bit about my background. Uh, like I said, I grew up in a Christian family. 
and uh, I, you know, I would have called myself a, a believer from a young age, but really didn't know what it meant to have a true relationship with God. For me, it was more of just a, you know, yeah, you accept Jesus, then you kind of go on with life. It's just more like, oh, yeah, okay, I, I'm forgiven. Jesus paid the price, and then I just kind of kind of move on with life. I, there was no real relationship, no, no real even understanding of true repentance and what it means to turn your life to God and follow him and walk with him. And so as I was growing up, I was uh, exposed to pornography at a, at a young age, well, middle school type age, and kind of drawn into, you know, sexual sin and drawn into more of the party lifestyle, going into high school, just going into the, par- the you know, typical worldly party lifestyle, drinking and partying and drunkenness and, again, you know, sexual sin, all that stuff, and never, never felt guilty about it, never felt like I was even doing anything wrong because I was deceived. Sin is deceptive. Sin has, sin has a way of deceiving you. The enemy is deceptive. He comes and, and he deceives, and I was drawn into this deception, but yet I would have said I'm a Christian, I was going to church, and then um, when I went to college, I got involved in a campus ministry during my freshman year, but the whole time, again, I'm living this double life. I'm living this party lifestyle, sinful lifestyle, then going to Bible studies on you know, Thursday nights and involved in the discussions and didn't even see the, the problem with that. And at the end of my freshman year in college, I was invited to this retreat. Make a long story short, God really met me at this retreat in a powerful way, came under a true conviction of the Holy Spirit. God began to really convict me of the sins I was living in. And uh, I, I got to this point of a fork in the road where I knew God was drawing me to surrender, to true repentance. And I got to this place, and I just I was in a deep place of brokenness, repentance, confessing my sin to God. I had one of the leaders come and pray for me. And I just encountered God in such a powerful way in that moment. I experienced the love of God just, uh, just beginning to come into my heart in a tangible way. And in that time, I was radically set free from bondage. I was radically set free from every, you know, the strongholds to sin, this addiction to sexual sin and pornography. It was literally broken in that moment in such a powerful way that never was a problem from that moment on. That was uh, years ago. I was 19 years old, and, and it just radically changed my life. And so I, I came out of that place, and I was just hungry. I was so hungry because I, I knew God was so real. I met him in such a tangible way. And so I was hungry. I went home from that retreat, and I, I just started to devour the Bible. just started to read the Bible. And I set a goal that I was going to read the Bible in one year. You know, the old one-year plan, right? I could not stop reading the Bible, and I ended up reading the Bible in three weeks. It turned into the three-week plan. I was just, I was so hungry. I was just up till all, all hours of the night, just devouring Scripture, reading the Bible. And, and God just began to lead me in this journey of just true relationship with Him and true walking with Him. And sometime along the way, as I began to get more involved in the campus ministry and began to uh, be you know, leading um, Bible studies and prayer meetings, I was, I was passionate to see people set free because I experienced such freedom in my own encounter with God, and I just kind of assumed that that's what everyone experienced. I kind of assumed that's what happened, you know, every believer was experiencing just this incredible freedom, but as I was getting to know people and hear what was going on in their lives, the the bondages, the oppressions, I was like, oh man, so I was passionate to see people set free, because God, when when he sent his son Christ Jesus to the cross, it wasn't just for forgiveness, it was for freedom, and so I became passionate about this, but I knew nothing about how casting out demons had anything to do with it. I knew nothing about evil spirits and casting out demons, and it was, it was the last thing on my, on my mind. I was just passionate to see people experience freedom. And so as I was just hungering for, for, for the Lord, I would, I would read these stories in the Gospels. So I'd read these, t- these encounters that, you know, Jesus, he was healing people. Jesus, he's casting out demons. Everywhere he went, it seems like he was having these encounters, you know, have you noticed that when you read the Gospels, when you read Matthew, Mark, you read Luke, you read these stories, and it seems like everywhere Jesus went, he was encountering people that needed deliverance from evil spirits. And so I was reading those stories, and I was asking the Lord, God, where is this? How come I've never seen this happen? How come I've never seen a healing happen or, or a uh, deliverance happen? And, and I was just hungry for truth. I didn't know, I didn't know the difference about you know, all these theological debates and you know, gifts of the Spirit today. Not the, I, didn't, I didn't understand all that stuff. I just wanted what was real. I just wanted everything God had. And as I was seeking him, as I was in this time of just hungering for truth, the Lord began to speak to me about the ministry of deliverance. He began to call me into it. And the first way was through a a prophetic dream that that I had. 
And I knew God could speak through dreams because you see it in, in the scriptures. And, and, but, but, but I didn't understand you know, all the prophetic symbolism and stuff like that. But, but I, I had this dream. And in this dream, I was eating at an all-you-can-eat buffet. How many people like to eat? Come on now. All-you-can-eat buffet. Here I was. I was at this buffet. And I, I was hungry, so I got up for more food. So I stood up, and I'm walking to, my, to, the, to the buffet, and out of the corner of my eye, I see a man standing there who has a real just dark appearance, a countenance, and, and it's just kind of like an evil look in his eyes. And I just kind of noticed him, and I, I get to the buffet. I, I come back to the table, and as I'm sitting at the table, this man begins to walk toward me. And so he's walking toward me, and as he's walking toward me, I, I stand up, and I, I instantly knew that he had a demon. As we, again, this is in a dream. I just instantly perceived, I discerned that there was a, de a demonic influence that was controlling him or, or harassing him or tormenting him. I instantly knew it. At the same time, I had this well of power, like, flow from out of my belly. I just felt this, like, overwhelming boldness and power just begin to flow up from me in my belly. And I said, in the name of Jesus, I command you, come out of him. And all of a sudden, he started to, like, heave and, like, cough. And, like, and, and this, this demon left this person, and his countenance changed. He was filled with joy. He came out just like, thank you, thank you so much. And, and then I woke up from the dream. I woke up from the dream, and... My, my response was, avoid all-you-can-eat buffets. <laughs> Stay away. Stay away. <laughs> my honest response, if you want to know the truth, my honest re response was, there was two things. One, I knew God was trying to get my attention because it was so vivid. It was so clear. I knew it wasn't just a random dream. I knew he, but my, but my other response was, I don't want to do this. <laughs> I literally, for the next couple days, was afraid I was going to meet the person that I saw in the dream. I literally was, like, on edge. Like, everywhere I went, like, am I going to see this person in real life? Am I going to actually have to do this? Am I going to? I did not want to do this. I did not. I never thought I could do this. I never saw myself casting out demons. I, I knew nothing about it. And God began to lead me on this journey over the next several months and years where I, I began to come across some teaching and resources that just began to open my eyes to the truth and just kind of uncover some of the misunderstandings, which we're going to go over tonight. Just Tonight's kind of going to be like an intro to deliverance. We're going to cover some of the foundational teachings because there's been so much misunderstanding, so much confusion, so much fear about this topic. And I didn't know what the Bible taught about it. And so... I was exposed to some just good teaching, good biblical teaching, and, and, and God just began to open my eyes to this. And I was like, wow, this is so different than I realized. This is, this is much more relevant than I realized. Deliverance, casting out demons is not just, from the, for, not just for the old old times of the church, not just for the gospels, not just for Jesus' time. This is for today. And, and evil spirits can influence people in ways that I never even really realized. Began, I, began, I began to see the world through a different lens. When people would share what they were walking through and what they were experiencing, I began to realize, oh, maybe there could be a, a demonic aspect to this. So I had this new understanding as I had this, these, these resources and these books. And, um, but I'd never done it before. It was, still, it was still theory to me. And I'll never forget the first time I actually saw a deliverance where God moved and I saw demons cast out. I was, I had just graduated from, from college and I was about to be married in about a month after that. And so I was at my, at my parents' house and my parents had this Bible study at their home once a week, Bible study at their house. And they said, Jake, why don't, you know, why don't you teach your home from school? You know, why don't you do a teaching on one of these nights? And I'm like, sure. What should I teach you? I'm like, oh boy, do I, do I do this? Do I not do this? Do I, do I bring, you know, I said, all right, I'm going to do a message, and I called it Freedom in Christ. That's a, that's a, that's a safe title, right? <laughs> that's a safe title, right? Um, you know, that's, everyone could go with that, right? Freedom in Christ, right? So I called it Freedom in Christ. I did this teaching about how Jesus came to set us free. He shed his blood, not just for our forgiveness, but to break the power of sin, to deliver us from the, from the kingdom of darkness, to, to free us from demonic oppression. I, and I just did like a little 15-minute part of the teaching on, on deliverance, just a short part of the teaching. And there was a young man that approached me afterwards. He had never been to, the, to that Bible study. It was his first time there, and he, he came up to me afterwards. He said, hey, you were talking about this demonic stuff, and I'm kind of wondering, you know, if, 
if you might want to, you know, could pray for me. He was sharing kind of his story, and he had, he had been severely tormented in his mind, um, and he had been suicidal, and, and I was asking him more questions, and, you know, when he was younger, he had dabbled into some witchcraft. He had messed around with some spiritual things that were uh, not of God, of the occult and witchcraft. And so I'm like, okay, I'm putting the pieces together here. He opened that door there, and, and now he's had this oppression. I said, well, you know, would you be willing to pray through a prayer of deliverance? Now, I'd never done this before. So tip number one, if you don't know what you're doing, act like you do. <laughs> not, not really, but kind of. I mean, I, I, I said, hey, you know, would you be willing to pray through a prayer of deliverance? And, and he was like, yeah, sure, okay. And so I get my sister. Tip number two, bring someone along with you. <laughs> don't do my sister had just been recently filled with the Holy Spirit, and she was, you know, kind of on the same journey with me. And so I was like, hey, you know, would you come you know, help me pray for this guy? And so we went down into, into my bedroom. We went down. Uh, in, yeah, and so everyone's upstairs just fellowshipping, eating together, you know, having a good time. And, and, and you know, we're about to go, go to battle here. And, and so, and so he, this... Uh, this, this, this young man, I, just, I, I, I talked to him about deliverance, and I had this book that I had read, and I opened it up, and there's a prayer for deliverance in the book. I said, hey, we're going to read through, I'm going to have you read through this prayer. I'm going to have you go through it. There's repentance and for, you know, forgiveness and renouncing that involvement in the occult, and I'm, I'm going to have you go through that, and once you're done, I'm going to pray for you. And so, again, just, you know, acting like I know what I'm doing, and he's kind of going along. And, and so he starts going through this prayer. He starts verbalizing this prayer. He's reading through, and everything's, you know, going, going fine. And, and a couple minutes minutes in, something started to change. He's about halfway through the prayer, and all of a sudden, he starts to take big, deep breaths. He's like, just like, something's changing. He's like taking these deep breaths, and, and then all of a sudden, he's trying, to, he's trying to verbalize the prayers, but something's restricting him. He's trying to pray, but he's, he's not able to get the words out. He's, he's having to struggle through. Something's like keeping him from, from praying. And so this is all going on, and I'm kind of like, you know, looking at my sister. She's kind of looking at me, and we're kind of like, you know, what's going on here? And, and so he, he, he gets through the prayer. Finally, he gets his way through the prayer, and I begin to pray. I, I lay my hand on, begin to pray, begin to command, you know, every demon to come out. And all of a sudden, he starts to have a demonic manifestation. His arms start to curl up and twist up, and he falls backward, and he lands on my bed, and he's just like laying there, and I begin to just... Do as best as I knew how from what I learned from this book. I just began to command the demons. And he was delivered from, I would guess, five to seven demons. I don't know, it was a long time ago, but it was about either somewhere between five and seven demons that would came, come to the surface and would speak out of him, and I would command it to go, and they began to leave through his mouth. He began to heave, and it would, it would be released from, uh, to come out of him. And so this was an eye opening experience. I. I I had had the dream, I had had the teaching, but it was still theory. Now there was an experience that was lining up with what I saw in Scripture. It was lining up with what I read in this book. I'm like, I did not sleep much that night. I was laying in bed, my wheels were turning, I'm just like, re reliving the night. Thing. And all of a sudden I'm thinking to myself, where do they go? <laughs> where... Because it happened on my bed, literally. He literally, he literally happened on my bed. <laughs> and I'm laying there. I'm like, I wonder where they go. Like, what, what, what's like? Had all these questions. That was my first ex real experience casting out demons, and that was uh, almost about, about 16 years ago. About 16 years ago. And ever since that first time, you know, my wife and I got married about a month later, and. Uh, and then we were involved in different ministry settings. I was a, a teacher at a Christian school for a while. I've been a youth pastor, young adult pastor, I'm a lead pastor now for the last five years. And every setting we've been in, we have seen people set free from evil spirits. It's been a consistent part from young to old, every age bracket. And um, we've just seen it on a consistent basis now. And, you know, in personal prayer settings, in group settings like this, leading sometimes hundreds of people all, all at one time. And, and we've seen God do incredible, incredible things. And, I, and I've just begun to see how relevant and how valuable this ministry really is for today. And I have a heart to remove the obstacles, remove the fear, remove the stigma, remove the confusion. There, there, there doesn't need to be a stigma about this topic. We don't need to be afraid to address this topic. And it's, it's on the heart of God because he wants to see his people free. 
Because we cannot move forward into all that we have, all God has for us, if we are still in bondage. So in Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 1, we're at the, at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. Starting at verse 21, I'm reading from the New King James Version, by the way. But uh, in Mark chapter 1, starting at verse 21, it says, They went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So the, the first thing people recognized about the ministry of Jesus and the teaching of Jesus was authority. There was something about his words that carried weight. There was a weightiness. There was a substance. It got their attention. It wasn't what they were used to, to hearing. And then it goes right on in verse 23. It says, there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. Now that term, unclean spirit, it's used throughout the New Testament. Other words that are used are demon and evil spirit. And they seem to be used you know, interchangeably. These are, these are uh, spiritual beings that are part of the kingdom of darkness. Part of the kingdom of darkness. And it says there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit. He cried out saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? The answer to that is yes, by the way. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. When the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority... He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. I want you to notice something here. That the first thing that Jesus became well known for was his authority to cast out evil spirits. It was the first thing that caused people to begin to spread the word. It was the first thing that caused people to begin to share with their neighbors and their friends. When they, when they left the synagogue that day, we can see it later throughout that chapter. It says later in that evening, the crowds of people gathered. The crowds of people came, those that were sick, those that were influenced by demonic spirits. And they came to Jesus and he cast out the demons. He healed those who were sick and he cast out many demons, it says in verse 34. It was the first thing that Jesus became well known for. It was the first thing that, that, that he was um, recognized in his ministry for. When Jesus was teaching in the synagogue, he was teaching with such an authority. Here's, here's how I would read this. Here's how I, based on now my experience in this and how I see this in the scriptures, it was as if the authority that Jesus was preaching with and the anointing that he carried forced the demonic spirit to come to the surface so that it could be dealt with. See, this man was in their synagogue. Now, we don't know anything about his background. We don't know his story, but we know he was in the synagogue. So he, this is somebody who attended the Jewish synagogue. That's their equivalent of church, right? That's their equivalent of coming to the weekly time of worship and teaching, instruction. And so there he was in the midst of the people of God. There he was. And, and he needed freedom. There was an area of his life. We don't know what it was. We don't know what allowed that to happen. But he was there among them. And as Jesus is preaching, as Jesus is teaching, this, um, this, this demonic spirit gets agitated and comes to the surface and begins to scream out. And I've seen this happen so many times. That's why I can, I can, I can just so picture this because I've seen it. Because, see, it, when a person has an evil spirit, it's not always obvious to the natural eye. That was one of the misunderstandings I had, you know, just, 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 with a, just not, with no understanding. I used to think if a person had a demon, that it would be obvious to everybody. 
Like they'd be always manifesting. They'd be always, you know, rolling on the floor. They'd be always screaming and, you know, pulling their hair out. Or, you know, you know like, like we see in Mark 5, the guy with the legion. Of, he had a legion of demons. And he was kind of in a constant state of torment. But this guy was sitting in the synagogue. He was just sitting there like everybody else. He didn't walk in the door and you say, oh, he has a demon. He needs deliverance. No. He sat there like everybody else. He was among the people of God. But when the demon manifested, then it became known. See, that's what a demonic manifestation is. It's when a demon becomes known. It comes to the surface. It's possible to have a demon, and it's working in your life and influencing you in certain ways, sometimes subtle ways. Um, but, but it's not like you're always running around freaking out like this person. He was there like everybody else. But when it comes to the surface, that, that authority came in, that anointing came in. Now, again, in the, um, reading from the King, um, New King James Version, and the first thing that the demon said is, let us alone. That's what demons want. Don't mess with us. Leave us alone. Don't talk about us. Don't confront us. Don't call us out. Don't cast us out. Just let us be. That's what the demons want. And I'm sad to say that in so much of the Western church, that's exactly what we've done. That's exactly what we've done. In so much of the Western church, demons are actually comfortable. They're actually comfortable. Because they can actually be present. They can be there. They can be you know, harassing and tormenting and influencing, and, and, and they're not being confronted. They're not being exposed, and they're not being expelled. And I have to wonder, how many weeks, how many months, how many years did this man come to the synagogue week after week after week after week, month after month, year after year? How many times did he attend the synagogue and not get the help he needed? They said, leave us alone, Jesus. Leave, leave us, just, just let us be. Just let us do our thing. We'll, we'll leave you alone. We'll... See, we cannot afford to avoid this topic any longer. We cannot afford to avoid this topic any longer. I'm telling you, the need is so great. The need is so great. And we have to keep everything in a proper balance we keep our eyes on Jesus. He's our main focus. We don't, we don't get obsessed with, you know, demons and all that, right? So I'm not talking about that, you know, we put all of our attention on the kingdom of darkness. But I'm also saying we can't ignore this reality. I'm also saying we, we have to put it in its place. For the ministry of Jesus, it was front and center. It was front and center. See, demonic influence can, can impact such a wide range of areas in a person's life. Our, our spiritual growth can be hindered by a demonic influence. Our mental health can be impacted. Our emotional well-being can be impacted. Our relationships can be impacted. Our physical health can be impacted by demonic spirits. That's all we see in the New Testament. We see examples of it in the New Testament. I've seen people... I'll, I'll, I'll share some testimonies as we go. I'll probably share a lot more tomorrow night. Uh, we'll see, see what direction things go. But just to give you some ideas of how, how relevant it is for, for modern times, for our times. I've seen people, many, many examples of people set free, delivered from addiction to pornography or sexual addiction, sexual sin, when they were set free from an evil spirit. When an unclean spirit was cast out. Now, that doesn't mean you can blame everything on the devil and say, well, it was the devil's fault. There's still a need for repentance. But some people are in bondage. When a person's in bondage, they want to be free, but they can't get free. Their heart is turned, and they're, and they're seeking God, but there's actually an enslavement there. There's a chain that needs to be broken. There's a demonic influence. I've seen people set free from addictions. We've seen drug addictions. Eating disorders. Different types of oppression, depression, crippling fears, anxieties, suicidal thoughts, intrusive thoughts, physical sicknesses, infirmities that actually had a demonic element to them. 
And so really, in so many ways, deliverance has been the missing link. It's been, it's been the missing link in the process of sanctification, in the process of growth, in the process of transformation, in the process of healing. So often it's been a missing link. And so I want to cover some basic truths about demonic influence. I want to go through this here, covering some basic truths about demonic influence. I'm going to try to move through these. Try to be quick here so we can get into a, a ministry time. I want to have some time for ministry tonight. I have no doubt God wants to move tonight. God wants to bring freedom. God wants to set people free in this room tonight. God wants to bring deliverance. A couple basic truths about demonic influence. Number one, demonic influence is real. That's a very simple statement, right? Demonic influence is real. We can't pretend like demons don't exist. We can't pretend like we never have to talk about this topic. We can't pretend like we can put our head in the sand. I wish we could just say, well, let's just focus all our attention on Jesus and we'll never have to talk about this. I wish we could do that. But, the, but Scripture says for us to not be ignorant of the enemy's schemes, right? Lest he take advantage of us. Right? Scripture says, resist the devil and he will flee. It doesn't say ignore the devil and he'll flee. Right? Right? So again, while my primary focus is on Jesus, my relationship with God, obeying him, walking with him, knowing him, serving him, worshiping him, that's my focus, right? Right? But I can't pretend this doesn't. We have to come to grips with the reality of demonic influence. I've, I've, I've found this out. Um, in, in, in the Christian world today is that you can talk about the devil all you want and nobody really bats an eye and nobody thinks anything about it. You start talking about demons, people are like, eh, it's kind of, that's, that's out there. Right? You start, it's, it's true. I mean, you could, if, if you told somebody, man, I'm just under attack from the devil today. I just feel like the devil's attacking me. You know? Nobody would, you know, okay, let's pray. We'll pray for you. We'll stand with you, you know, spiritual warfare, whatever. Um, if you said, I feel like there's a demonic spirit that I need to cast out. It's kind of like it's a whole different conversation. Isn't that true? Right? But when we have spiritual warfare, when we have, who do you think we're dealing with? The devil's not omnipresent. Right? We're dealing with demonic spirits. Okay? So demonic influence is real. And it's Relevant to understand this. Secondly, demonic influence is common, not rare. This is one that was a mindset shift for me. Because I, in my understanding, probably because of never seeing it happen. Never seeing it happen growing up in church. So I just thought, well, yeah, demons must exist because they're in the Bible. Jesus dealt with them, so they, they must be real. But it must be extremely rare for a person to ever need deliverance. I mean, it must be like, you know, once in a lifetime thing. Or maybe if I went to this dark, dark place, you know, this jungle where they did witch, you know, witch doctors and voodoo. And, you know, the dark jungles of Africa. Or I went to Haiti where it was all out in the open. Maybe I might encounter somebody, right? But I never thought I would encounter somebody here or in regular life. But there's a problem with that thinking is that it doesn't line up with the example of Scripture. It doesn't line up with the example of Jesus. You know, in Mark 1, verse 39, it says Jesus was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. That was a summary of his ministry. He was preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. I want you to understand this. It was as common for Jesus to cast out a demon as it was for him to preach a sermon. It was as normal. It was paired together. And so we can see that all throughout the Gospels. That he did it many times, over and over again. Multitudes would come to him for this. And he was ministering primarily who, to who? The people of God, to the Jewish people who at that time, they had a, a sense of, of a fear of God. They had a sense of understanding of Scripture, right? So imagine then if you then take that to the, a pagan culture where, where there, it's everything, anything goes and it's all, I, I, all the idolatry and all that's going on. So it's actually very common for people to need deliverance. 
It's not uncommon. Now, there's different degrees of demonic influence. Not every situation is the same. We can see that in the Gospels, right? We just read in Mark 1 about the man in the synagogue. He had one unclean spirit, it describes. Okay? Now, if you know um, about Mary Magdalene, how many spirits was she delivered from? Seven, right? It says, Mary Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, right? So there was one, there were seven. I mentioned the guy who had a legion of demons in Mark 5, which indicates likely there was thousands of demons, because a legion is a reference to a large troop of soldiers in the thousands. So he probably had thousands of demons. So one all the way up to thousands, that's a wide range. That's a very different, so not every situation is the same. Not every, it's, yeah, the, the man with the legion, that's rare. That's a rare situation. That's, that's extreme. But the man in the synagogue and the Mary Magdalene, that's not rare. That's not rare at all. I've, I've seen that over and over and over again. Just to give you an idea, I was, oh boy, I'm, I'm going to skip that idea. I'm going to keep going here, just look, trying to, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to, okay, I'll, <laughs> if you insist. <laughs> I, was, I was speaking at a youth group, now I'm in, again, Lancaster County, and Lancaster has a, uh, a large background of Amish and um, Mennonite churches, which I didn't know anything about when I moved there. I moved there eight years ago, I didn't know anything about uh, that, that background, so I've come to know more about the culture and that. And so I was, I was speaking to a youth group. It was a Mennonite church. It was the oldest church in Lancaster County, over 300 years old. And um, they asked me to come and do a teaching on deliverance for their youth group. This is probably three or four years ago, four or five years ago. I can't remember exactly, four, three or four years ago, something like that. And, I, and so here I am to this you know, group of conservative Mennonite church kids, basically, right? And I come out, and the Holy Spirit led me to speak about the man with the legion of demons, which is not, I don't often do that. I've taught on that, but I, I, I normally start with this guy here in Mark 1. It's a little more, you know, relatable, right? And so I just, you know, you know I'm just kind of coming out the gate, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying. To, there, it, it's like a wall. There is a wall there. Like, I'm like trying to, like, I'm, I'm trying to tell jokes. No one's laughing. I mean, it's just like, they're just like closed. I'm like, I'm like, oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> But about halfway through, something began to shift. Because as I'm teaching, I'm like, I'm like plowing through, I'm like teaching this. And I began to notice a few of the young people that were sitting in the group. There's probably 25 students there, high school age. I noticed probably two, three, four of them were beginning to have the beginnings of demonic manifestations. And I've learned to discern as I'm observing Sometimes it happens internally where, we, where it's not observable. Like it was, this guy, was, he yelled out. It was real observable. But sometimes people begin to feel things moving in their body. Sometimes people begin to feel things like stirring in their stomach. All of a sudden they get nauseous. They're not physically sick, but something's like moving around. They feel something kind of grip their throat. They feel pain come on them. They feel like they want to get up and get out of the room. Or they start to like shake and tremble and start to cry. Like, so as I'm speaking, all of a sudden I start to observe a few of them beginning to like start to tremble and shake and tears start to come down their eyes. And, and I just kind of picked up on it and I said, I said, you know, right now in this room, there's a few of you that are, you're beginning to experience the beginning of demonic manifestations. And I want you to be at peace and don't, don't be afraid because that's a sign you're going to be set free tonight because the devil's getting nervous because demons are being exposed they're getting nervous. They're getting agitated. Be at peace. You're going to be set free tonight. And all of a sudden, the whole atmosphere just shifted in the whole room. All of a sudden, they're all leaning in, like, listening to my every word, like, hanging on every word, like, what is going on here? This is real. And at the end of that meeting, I had them all stand up, begin to pray a prayer of deliverance, like we're going to do here in a little bit. We're going to pray through a prayer, leading them through. And then begin to minister to them. And I would guess that half of the young people there got delivered from an evil spirit that night. Tangibly. Tangibly. In a conservative Mennonite church group. Right? And, I, and that's the pattern I've seen. That it's not uncommon. And I, I want to say this here. There's nothing to be ashamed of if you need deliverance from an evil spirit. It does not make you an evil person. If you need deliverance. See, again, we have this idea, oh, if a person 
is, quote, possessed. We use that term in a wrong way, really. But we, we think, well, that means they must be really evil or they've really, you know, um, and that's not, the, that's not always the case at all. Sometimes people are oppressed, they're afflicted, they're tormented. And it doesn't mean you're an evil person. So it's, it's actually common. It's not, it's not rare. Third truth. A third truth about demonic influence is that certain things can open the door to demonic influence. Certain things can open the door. What do I mean? We use this phrase, open doors. And what this term means, it simply means it's an access point where evil spirits can gain access to a person's life. Because demons can't just arbitrarily pick people and say, I'm going I'm to go in, in that person today. I'm going to, you know. Now, they might be on the lookout, right? The Bible says that the devil's like a lion, ro- ro- a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, right? But it says this in, in Matthew chapter 12, I think it's verse 43. It says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes to dry places seeking rest. When he finds none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. So the demon referred to the person as a house, as a house, a dwelling place. And how do you get in the house? Well, you get in through the door, right? So in the spiritual realm, we are literally like real estate in the spiritual realm. Now, what's God's intention? God's intention, right? He calls us to be a house of God a dwelling place of God, a temple of the Holy Spirit. And when you get saved, when you've given your life to the Lord, you are redeemed, you are purchased. And God becomes the owner of the house. Right? Okay? But there's doors that can be opened up. And if a door gets opened up, the enemy takes advantage of that. Just like if I left my door wide open, you know, if I left my house for a month and just left the door wide open... Now, who knows what could get in there? Thieves could get in there. Uh, pests could get in there. All kind of stuff could get in there. And I'm still the owner of the house, but there's unwanted intruders that have gotten in the house, right? So there's certain things, and I'm just going to name a few of them really quickly. Uh, one of them is ongoing, unrepentant sin, right? When, we wa- when instead of walking in the light, we choose to walk in darkness. Instead of walking in repentance, we begin to justify sin. We begin, I'm not talking about you stumble into sin and then you repent. I'm talking about when a person begins to agree with sin. When a person begins to uh, walk in it and justify it and live in it and harbor it and, 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 and keep in that place of darkness, it's like they're keeping a door open. It says in Ephesians chapter 4, it says, Don't let the sun go down on your anger, nor give place to the devil. Right? So, in other words, the anger, if it wasn't properly processed... And if it wasn't released, if you let it fester, it turns into bitterness, it turns into rage, it turns into hatred. It's like it's 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 growing. That door then begins to be open. You give place to the devil. Okay? And so ongoing sin, it's unrepentance, can be an open door. Trauma and abuse can be a major one. I've seen this over and over and over again in ministering to people that when they've gone through traumatic experiences, when they've been in abusive relationships, when they've experienced maybe abusive incidents in their lives, maybe they were sexually abused, maybe they were violent, you know, there was violence or or physical abuse, there was word destructive words and curses that were just released against them, um, different all these different types of abuse. In that situation, it's not so much that they committed a sin, it's that they were sinned against. And the devil takes advantage of it to bring oppression, to bring affliction, to bring torment. I've seen that over and over again. Sometimes it can be unforgiveness, where we harbor hatred and resentment. Unforgiveness places us in a spiritual prison. Matthew 18, there's a whole parable about this, about the unforgiving servant, and long story short, just for time's sake, but in that situation, when the one who received the forgiveness from, that, from the king in the story, but didn't forgive his fellow servant, he ended up in a spiritual prison. He ended up being placed in prison, being tormented. And that's a, that's a picture, symbolically, of what can happen in the spiritual realm for us. Uh, sometimes it's delving into the occult, like I mentioned, the young man, that first young man I prayed for, 
you know, w- w- whether it's witchcraft, whether it's, um, you know, psychics or divination or fortune telling or trying to tap into the spiritual realm. Now, I mean, God is supernatural and the Holy Spirit is supernatural. He can give us supernatural gifts. The biblical gifts of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians, lists these gifts, tongues and healing, prophecy, all those things. Those are legitimate gifts of of, of the Holy Spirit. But if we try to tap into the supernatural in a way that is outside of the one true living God, we're getting into dangerous territory. So, so when people try to, and sometimes it's out of curiosity, I'm just going to, I'm going to get my fortune, I'm going to get my palm read, I'm just going to, or maybe just for fun, or I'm just going to, you know, call a psychic, or, you know, I'm just going to dabble and, you know, play with the Ouija board a little bit and just see what happens, right? Sometimes it's little things like that, and we don't realize we're crossing into a territory that God has forbidden us to step into, and the enemy takes advantage of that big time. So any type of occultic, you know, new age, all those types of things can very much open the door to demonic influence. Sometimes it's um, generational influences that have passed down a family line where, where there's a pattern. You know, our, we, we, there's a spiritual inheritance that we receive from our family lines. Blessings, but it could also be, be curses. And um, there can be sometimes patterns that get passed down and uh, demonic influences that, that can move down a generation. So th- th- those are some of the main open doors. And really, deliverance involves closing the door and casting out the spirit. Those two, two sides of that. Now, here's, the, here's a big one. Christians can need deliverance from demons. This is the fourth truth here we're going through. Christians can need deliverance from demons. So there's this big theological debate. You know, can a Christian have a demon? You know, I actually wrote a book with that title. I actually did. I wrote, a, I wrote a short little book, Can a Christian Have a Demon? You open it up, it says, yes. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> I did write a book called Can a Christian Have a Demon? <laughs> and the answer is yes. <laughs> but the book actually has content. It's like 60, 70 pages. But, but here's this is a big theological debate, well, and, and, and here's the, the million-dollar question. Well, how can a person who's a temple of the Holy Spirit also have a demonic spirit? It sounds like a valid, it is a valid question, right? Right? How can a person who's been redeemed by God, there's been a transaction that's made, how can, how can we say there's an evil spirit there, right? Here's what I think it comes down to. I think it comes down to a misunderstanding of what it means to have a demon. And a misunderstanding of what it means to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. Because yes, when you are born again, you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He comes to live inside of you. You are redeemed. You're purchased. Right? That's absolutely true. It's also true, though, that after our salvation, we're walking on a journey of transformation. We're walking on a journey of sanctification, which is the fancy word for being made more holy, being made more like Christ. We're walking on a journey of being healed and restored. We're walking on a journey with with the Lord. And so there's a misunderstanding of what it means to have a demon. Now, many New Testament translations use the word possessed, but when you look at the original language of the the Greek in the New Testament, that's not actually a good word. Really, it's more to have a demon or to be oppressed by a demon, to be influenced by a demon. Uh, that's the word I like to use, influence, demonic influence. Because when you think of the word possession, it means that you're owned. And so a Christian is not owned by a demon. A Christian cannot be possessed by a demon, but that doesn't mean you can't have a demon. Does that make sense? A demon being present doesn't mean it owns you. Right? And, and when you look at the... The temple in the Old Testament. The temple in the Old Testament was a multifaceted building. It wasn't just like a little box where God was there so nothing else could be there, right? Right? It had three major parts, the, inner, the uh, Holy of Holies, inner courts, outer courts. It had lots of rooms and chambers and facets to it. It was a big complex. That's what the temple was like. Right? And there was times in the Old Testament where literally demon worship happened in the temple of God. 
King Manasseh set up altars to false gods and worshiped demons in God's temple. That was the temple in the Old Testament. They literally set up idols. The Apostle Paul said to sacrifice to an idol is to sacrifice to a demon. They literally brought demons in the house of God. Now, demons, do they belong in the house of God? No. But that doesn't mean they can't be there automatically just because it's the temple of God. And so I believe if you take that to the New Testament, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we have different parts as well. The Bible talks about our soul, talks about our heart, our mind, talks about our body, our flesh, talks about our spirit, right? And so the Holy Spirit comes to indwell us in our spirit. We become one with him in, this, in the spirit. But there's other parts of our being that might still have areas where the enemy has a hold because of doors that have been opened. And so the way I like to describe this, it really helps, this illustration I found really helps people, is it's like if, if I was going to buy a house. Any, anyone like to flip houses? Anyone like to refurbish houses? Anybody do that? Maybe a few. Okay. If you were going if, if to buy a house that you were intending to refurbish, and you decided that you were going to purchase the house as is, you were just going to, you were going to get the house, um, you're going to get the house, and you're just going to purchase it as is. So there was a lot of repairs that were needed on that house. There was, you know, uh, doors that were busted open. There was holes in the wall. The carpet was all messed up. The pipes were wrong. There was a leaky roof, right? All that was there, but you said, I'm going to purchase it as is. And you, you have the money. You make a transaction. Now, see, the, the first owner didn't treat the house very well. But you're the new owner. A transaction happens. You are now the owner of the house. You go to live inside the house. Is the house ready yet? Is it refurbished yet? Is it? No, now you go through a process of transforming that house into what it's supposed to look like. You go through a process. You, you, you repaint. You, put, you patch up the holes. You, you, you fix the pipings. You put new carpet down. All the different areas of the house, room by room, you go through. And over the course of the next six months, year, all of a sudden, it's transformed into this incredible house. See, that's what it's like. See, a Christian that needs deliverance, yes, God is the owner of the house. The Holy Spirit comes in. But maybe there's a couple rooms in the house that need swept clean. That's what it's like when a Christian needs deliverance. You're not owned by the demon, but there's an area of your life that's come under demonic influence, maybe keeping you in bondage, maybe keeping you in torment, maybe keeping you in a place of affliction. It's not like you can't live your life, but maybe there's certain things that are holding you back or oppressing you or, or keeping you from moving forward fully into what God has. Let's stand to our feet because I want to... Begin to move us into a time of ministry here. That'll, that'll help me. That'll help me move forward. Bring this to a to a landing. One more truth I want to mention. Yeah, can we get a keyboard? That'd be great. The last truth I want to mention here is simply this. Believers are given authority over evil spirits in the name of Jesus. Believers are given authority over evil spirits. In the name of Jesus. What does that mean? That means that we do not need to be afraid of evil spirits. We do not need to be afraid of evil spirits. It says in Mark 16, 17, These signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. It says in Luke chapter 10, when Jesus sent out the 70 uh, other followers, a larger group beyond the 12, and they came back, so they said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus said, don't rejoice that the demons are subject to you, right? Rejoice that your name is written in heaven. So he, that's, he said, yeah, that's great. That's great. That's true. He, he validated that truth. But that's the place of spiritual authority that we have in Christ. It's in his name. It's because of him. It's because of Jesus. It's because he paid the price. It's because he gave us that authority. So that means that none of us needs to stay under demonic influence any longer. No one needs to stay. No believer needs to stay under demonic influence because we've been given authority. Jesus paid the price for our freedom. He never intended salvation without deliverance. Did you know that? 
God never intended salvation without deliverance. He never intended us to experience forgiveness, but not freedom. And so what we're gonna do tonight is we're gonna, we're gonna go through a prayer for deliverance. I've, I've led thousands of people through prayers just like this. And I've seen God move. I've seen God do incredible things in moments just like this. There was a young man that was at a meeting just like this. It was a, it was a, a training I was doing, a, a conference type thing. And he had, he had grown up and he was in a foster home and he had experienced abuse, he'd experienced trauma, he was in different homes. He, he was uh, addicted to pornography. He had struggled with same-sex attraction. He had all these different things that were going on in his life that were, that were happening. And he came to one of these meetings reluctantly, but, but he knew God was leading him. And, uh, he, had, he, had a, he had a basic understanding of the gospel, but the deliverance was kind of a weird thing. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure, I, I don't know about that, but he came to the meeting and he's sitting in the meeting and as I'm teaching, he's feeling all this stuff going on. He's like, uh, I've got to get out of here, but he stayed through, he stayed through the meeting. And then we, got, we, we, we go into this time of ministry and I begin to lead this prayer. And as I begin to lead this prayer, the Holy Spirit just begins to come upon him, he begins to minister to him. And as I'm ministering and just commanding these spirits to go, he's feeling the Spirit of God just come up and like, it's like, he described it when he shared his testimony as like a bucket with all these ping pong balls in it. And like the water got poured in and it was like all the things just came to the surface. And he got literally delivered that day, set free. This was a couple years ago. He shared his testimony a couple months ago. He's been two and a half years now free from the, from the addiction, from the sexual sin, from the temptation, set free. God wants to move in this room tonight. Let's close our eyes. I'm just going to ask the Holy Spirit to begin to minister. And then I'm going to lead us through a prayer. Thank you, Father. God, I ask for your Holy Spirit to move in this place, God. Lord, I thank you that the kingdom of heaven is here, tangible, within reach in this room, God. Father, I thank you for your heart, Lord, to set captives free in this room, God. Lord, I thank you that you want to heal the brokenhearted tonight, God. I thank you that you want to break the chains of demonic influence, God, from people's lives. God, I thank you that you are so good that you sent your son, Lord, not only to bring forgiveness, God, but to deliver us from the kingdom of darkness. And so I declare, God, that tonight is a night of salvation, that tonight is a night of deliverance in the name of Jesus. God, let the heavens open up in this room, Lord. Let the angels of God, Lord, ascend and descend, Father. Let your Holy Spirit fall among us, God, to bring freedom in Jesus' name. As I lead us through this prayer, Really, a prayer for deliverance, it's really based on James 4, 7. It says, submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee. Two parts right there, right? Submitting ourselves to God. The first half of this prayer is really going to be about submitting ourselves to God. So I'm going to lead us through. Sometimes that might be repentance from sin. If there's areas where you need to really come into the light and just confess and repent and turn from. It might be forgiving somebody that's hurt you releasing that bitterness and forgiving. It might be renouncing that occultic involvement. That's all, that's submitting ourselves to God. The second part is resisting the devil, telling it, him to go in Jesus' name. So as I lead you through this prayer, I want you to pray it. I want you to pray it from your heart. I want you to pray it out loud. I want you to pray it with, with faith, with boldness, with authority. I'm going to lead you through, and then there's going to be certain parts where you're going to fill in the blank and just kind of customize it for yourself. And then once we get through the whole thing, I'm going to begin to pray over you as a whole group, all right? And then when we dismiss, we'll have some personal ministry for people that want to receive more, okay? So I want you to pray after me. Say this. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for your grace and mercy to me. I ask for the Holy Spirit to come upon me and bring deliverance to me in the name of Jesus. I worship and honor you as the one true living God. And I submit my life to you, God. Lord Jesus Christ, I believe that you are the Son of God and that you're the only way to the Father. I believe that you came in the flesh, that you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose from the dead. 
Thank you for your finished work. Thank you that you came to set me free from the power of sin and to redeem me from the kingdom of darkness. Thank you that you came to heal my heart and set me free. We're going to pray through a time now just of of repentance, any areas where we just need to repent. So just say this. Say, Heavenly Father, I come into the light and I confess my sin to you to receive forgiveness, to receive cleansing, and to receive freedom. I turn away from sin. I desire to live a holy life pleasing to you by the power of your Holy Spirit. Specifically, I confess. Now take the next couple minutes as he just plays music in the background. If you just need to speak out, you need to confess, just just turn those sins over to the Lord right now. Just begin to speak those things out. Begin to verbalize in your own words. Thank you, Father. God, we turn away from every one of these sins, God. Thank you, Father. Just a few more seconds here. There's areas you just need to bring to the Lord. turn to you, Jesus. We turn to you, God. Lord, we can't do it on our own, Lord. We need you, God. We need you, Lord. We need you, God. Thank you for your grace. Your, your grace changes me on the inside, Lord. Thank you that your blood cleanses me from all unrighteousness. Thank you, Lord, for breaking the chains of condemnation right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I just say this, say, Lord Jesus, right now, I receive your grace. I receive your mercy. I receive your forgiveness. I receive the blood of Jesus to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I am forgiven. This next area we're going to walk through is praying and re- to release and to forgive anyone that has sinned against us, hurt us. This can be a, a hard step sometimes, but it can, it's really such an important step. And I just want to be clear that when we release people and forgive people, it's we're not saying it was okay if they sinned against us, if they betrayed or abused uh, I'm, I'm not saying you just stuff it and pretend like it never happened. I'm not trying to minimize it as if it wasn't painful. It also doesn't mean you need to keep allowing it to happen either, right? But it's between you and God releasing hatred, releasing revenge, releasing bitterness, and saying, God, because you forgave me, in light of your forgiveness, I choose to forgive. I release these ones, okay? There's healing that happens when we do that. We step out of a prison door when this when we when we make this choice, all right? So I'm going to lead us to do that right now, okay? Lord Jesus, because you have forgiven me, I choose to freely forgive anyone who has ever sinned against me or hurt me in any way. I lay down all bitterness. I lay down all hatred. I lay down all resentment. I lay down revenge. And I choose to forgive. Specifically, I forgive. 
Now I want you to name those people that you need to forgive. I want you to do it out loud, loud enough that you can hear it. You don't have to yell it so that the whole room can hear it, but just, just say, Jesus, I forgive, and speak that person's name. Speak that person's name. This healing coming, this healing be released. Jesus, I forgive. I forgive, Lord. Release, God. It's so important to make a clean break with the kingdom of darkness. It's like if you have a Ouija board in your house and you know you haven't looked, you haven't used it in 10 years, just, just get rid of it, right? What's the point of having it in that thing in your house, right? When it's it represents witchcraft, represents something that God says, don't don't dabble in that, right? Make a clean break, make a renunciation. You know, in the in the, in the New Testament, they burned their books of magic, their sorcery, because they were just cutting it off. Right? So we're gonna we're gonna make a clean break tonight. Just say this after me. Say, Lord Jesus. I renounce the kingdom of darkness and all of its works. I renounce everything that's connected to the occult or to the new age or to idolatry. I renounce witchcraft. I renounce divination, fortune telling, or any other activity that you have forbidden. Specifically, I renounce. Now again, as he plays, just take that time and just fill in the blank there. Whatever you need, to, whatever, whatever specifically relates to you, just speak it out loud. Say, I renounce. And just name that. that Jesus Christ is Lord. I declare that Jesus Christ is my Lord. And by the authority of Jesus' name, I speak to every evil spirit that has any influence in my life. And I command you to come out. Go in the name of Jesus. I want you to lift your hands for a minute as I begin to pray for you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. God, let the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, begin to fall in this room right now, Father. God, let the anointing that breaks the yoke, Lord, begin to be released in this place, begin to fall in this room. In the name of Jesus, I break the power of every demonic influence. I command every unclean spirit, come out in the name of Jesus Christ. I break the power. I command every demon that's influencing people in this room, come out in the name of Jesus. I rebuke the spirit of heaviness. Come out in Jesus' name. You spirit of heaviness, you spirit of depression, come out in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I break the power of that spirit of oppression. I say, leave them now, leave them now. Come out in the name of Jesus right now. I command you to lift off the people. I break your influence in Jesus' name. I break the power of that spirit of fear. I say, spirit of fear, come out in the name of Jesus right now. 
spirit of fear, come out from the people. Go from the people. Out right now. Out right now. In the name of Jesus, that spirit of fear comes out. It leaves you now. In Jesus' name, I rebuke that spirit of anxiety. I say, come out right now. Come out right now. Come out from the people right now. In the name of Jesus, it leaves you right now. It leaves you now. I break the power of the spirit of death. I say, come out in the name of Jesus. Spirit of death goes right now, goes right now. I say, spirit of suicide, come out in the name of Jesus. That spirit of suicidal thoughts, it goes right now, it leaves right now. Out in Jesus' name. Go from the people, go from the people. In the name of Jesus, I command you to come out. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. We're going to stay in this place for a few more minutes. Let's encourage you to engage with the Lord. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Just stay in a posture of receiving. You can put your hands down. You can keep them up, however, whatever's best for you to be in a posture of receiving right now. Come, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, would you move? Spirit of God, would you just minister? Would you release your grace, your power, your anointing? God, pour out your love right now into the hearts of people in this room. Stretch out your hand, Father. Touch your people, Lord. Touch your people, God, with your grace, with your love, with your peace. I thank you, Father. Come, Holy Spirit. Jesus, would you walk through this room? Would you minister, Lord, to your people right now? Thank you, Jesus, that you're walking through this room. I thank you, God. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I command the spirit of torment to come out in the name of Jesus. Spirit of torment out from their minds right now. Every spirit that torments the mind has to come out in Jesus' name. I rebuke that spirit of torment. It goes now in the name of Jesus. I command the spirit of infirmity to come out in the name of Jesus Christ right now. Every spirit that causes pain, affliction, infirmity, come out in the name of Jesus right now. Every spirit that causes sickness and disease, come out in the name of Jesus. Out from the people now. Go now in Jesus' name. Go in the name of Jesus. Spirit of pain, come out in the name of Jesus right now. Leave them now. Leave their bodies. Out from them now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Father, right now, I just ask you to bring release from bondage, release from bondage, release from enslavement, God, to addictions, to sinful habits. In the name of Jesus, I take authority over every unclean spirit that keeps people enslaved to sin. I command you to come out in the name of Jesus. I break the power of every spirit of pornography. Come out in the name of Jesus. Every spirit of lust, come out in the name of Jesus. Every spirit of perversion comes out right now, out right now, in the name of Jesus. Every spirit that keeps people enslaved to sexual sin, come out in the name of Jesus. Leave the people right now. Go from their lives right now. Lift off in Jesus' name. I break the power of a spirit of addiction. Spirit of addiction, come out. Leave the people now in Jesus' name. Go from their lives. Go from their lives. I break your power. In Jesus' name, I speak to every spirit, every unclean spirit that came through trauma, that came through abuse. In the name of Jesus, I command you, come out from the people now in Jesus' name. I command every spirit that came through sexual abuse to bring torment. Come out in Jesus' name. You leave the people now. You go out from them now. I command that spirit of shame. Go out now, out now, out now. Leave now in Jesus' name. Come, Holy Spirit. Move, God. Move by your Spirit. I thank you, God. I thank you, God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over the lying spirit. Every spirit that tells lies, every spirit that whispers lies in your heart and mind, 
I break the power of that lying spirit. I say, lying spirit, come out in the name of Jesus. Leave the people now. Go from them now in Jesus' name. I rebuke the spirit of rejection. Come out in Jesus' name. That spirit of rejection goes now. It leaves them now. Come in to lift off right now. Father, right now I break the curse of depression. Lord, every curse of depression, Lord. I command that spirit to be broken. I rebuke the spirit of depression. I command it to go out in Jesus' name. That dark cloud of depression, I command to lift off right now. Lift off right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father. God, let your Holy Spirit just come and do the work. Let your Spirit come, Lord. Minister to hearts, God. Lord, I release, I pray for the oil of the Holy Spirit would come and just minister healing to the hearts, God. Where there's been brokenness in the heart, Lord, bring release a healing anointing, God, to come and just minister to the mind, minister to the heart, Father, right now, by the authority of Jesus' name. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Now, as we're in this place of just ministering and praying and declaring here, I just want to ask, how many people have felt something come out, lift off, move from their move from them? Would you put a hand up if you felt something? Just put your hands up real high and be, begin to wave them around just so we can all we can just see. Look at that, look at that, look at that. Can we just give Jesus praise? That's awesome. That's awesome. That's amazing. God is so good. God is so good. Well, I want to do just like a, like a closing prayer over this corporate time. Then I'll hand it over and we can kind of dismiss and move into any individual ministry. Would you just put your hand over your heart? Just pray this out. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have purchased me, redeemed me by the blood of Jesus, and made me a temple of the Holy Spirit. I ask right now that your Holy Spirit would fill me to overflowing. Let every area of my life, every room of the house, be filled with the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. Now just, now just receive that for a minute. Just receive that. Father, I pray that you'd fill each one, God, with your Holy Spirit. Fill, God, with the Holy Spirit. God, let rivers of living water just begin to flow through them, God. Let cleansing streams just begin to flow through them, Father. God, let every area that was once occupied by a demonic presence, Lord, by a demonic influence, be filled with the Holy Spirit, with your truth, with your love, with your word, God. Lord, your blessing, I declare your blessing, your grace, God, your, your peace, Lord, and just a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen.